Well, thanks very much for the opportunity to be here. Uh, you'll tell from my accent that I'm not American. I'm actually a New Zealander, but I uh, trained in general surgery. I worked with the Africa in Mission in Kenya back in the 80s with my wife. And for the last 27 years, I've been with the Christian Medical Fellowship of the UK, which is the CMDA of the UK. And 18 months ago, I moved to the international CMDA, the International Christian Medical and Dental Association as CEO from January last year. And of course, did not anticipate COVID uh, like, like any of us. So we're looking at some of the new opportunities that the COVID area is, is uh, opening up. And it was interesting to see the WHO saying two years ago what the, the 10 biggest global threats would be of the decade, 2019, global influenza pandemic was number three, and uh, number six was preparing for epidemics in uh, 2020, but none of them anticipated coronavirus and our new reality. And of course, we have to remind ourselves that, of course, God is utterly sovereign and planned this from the beginning of time before the foundation of the world, because he's sovereign over the rise of fallen governments, the decisions of political leaders, which have been so influential, infectious diseases, of course, and the development of vaccines and medical treatments, indeed our lives and our deaths. And COVID has changed a lot of things, but it's not changed man's need for the gospel, the great commission, the certain growth of God's kingdom, the call to preach and heal the return of Christ, and the certainty of judgment or the new heaven and the new earth. So we uh, need to start there. And of course, Jesus in the Olivet Discourse in Luke 21, Matthew 24, Mark 13, talked about uh, pestilences as being a sign of those uh, times between his first and second coming. So this is our direction of travel. Where are we now? How it, will it impact economics and healthcare? Where were we before COVID? In other words, where are we starting from? And then in particular, what implications are there for healthcare mission? And that's what we're going to end with. So we're seeing this continued spread, different patterns in different countries. We're still quite early in the course of this pandemic. There are vulnerable populations and others that aren't vulnerable. And uh, there is some improvement of treatment and some hope of a vaccine, but it's quite early on. This is the global cases. You can see daily new cases peaking at the moment. Daily deaths still carrying on at about 6,000 per day, although the countries are changing for that. And the countries are, are different in their responses and in, the, and in the situation of the pandemic there. So I come from New Zealand originally, which got over it very, very quickly with some very swift measures. We've got a slight recurrence now, but uh, just a total of 23 deaths in a country of 5 million people. And then there's India, where things are just going up and up and up. Uh, the biggest number of new cases now. The US, you'll be well familiar with the, the second wave, which is now reducing. And then in some countries in Western Europe now, we're seeing a second wave, uh, which is quite serious. And we don't know where we'll be in a few weeks time in France and Spain, for example. The daily figures, an important column here is the total deaths. Uh, the USA, Brazil, India, and Mexico are the big four with others following, but the worst countries in the world in terms of deaths per million population are Peru and Belgium. And uh, I've highlighted on the left-hand column here in the top 20 deaths, six of those countries are in in uh, uh, Latin America. I think that's very significant for you guys uh, in particular. In, uh, in Africa, things have been much, much slower. You can't see South Africa here, but of the million cases in Africa, over 50% of them are just in one country, South Africa. And it's all around the major air hubs of Cairo, Nairobi, Johannesburg that we're seeing it. So very, very slow and we think there's still a lot to come. Of course, what's really important is the serology, how many people have had it. And uh, there is now a tracker that you can follow from the Lancet 
and the message from this, they look at all the, st all the studies of seroprevalence and the key message is that we're very early in this. If we even look at Brazil here, the, the national estimates are only up to 4%. So that means 96% of people have not yet been exposed to the virus in Brazil. We're well familiar with the, the basic stats. Most cases are mild, but 5% critical. Those over 60 are most susceptible. Those with pre-existing conditions, especially cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic respiratory disease, and only 1% of those uh, who are at greatest risk have, um, uh, have no other associated conditions. Men, twice as many as women, and then there is ethnicity plays a part, particularly with black and uh, Asian groups. How contagious and deadly is it? Well, it's somewhere we think around where Spanish flu was, but, and we can just thank the Lord that this is not something that is as, as infectious as chicken pox and as deadly as bird flu or Ebola. It's uh, very much in the middle, but that is the perfect storm in terms of rapid spread and shutting down economies and so on. And as far as infectious diseases go, these figures are a bit dated now from July, but it's second to TB. It's now past TB in terms of deaths. Vaccines, lots of trials, but only nine at phase three. We hear more news every day about what might or might not happen. And treatments, apart from prone positioning, ventilators, respiratory support, it's really just steroids and remdesivir that have shown a lot of uh, evidence-based promise, although there's lots of work going on. Uh, in terms of world history, where does this rank? Well, uh, by the time we get to uh, April next year, if it continues at the same rate, there'll be 2 million deaths and it will then become the uh, eighth most serious plague in human history in terms of death after the ones that I've highlighted here. And of course, only two of these, Spanish flu and HIV, are uh, in recent living memory. So we've been incredibly effective at slowing the spread, but there've already been 875,000 deaths in seven months, 6,000 per day. So looking at a million by the end of this month, 2 million by April next year, zero prevalence is still uh, less than 6% in most heavily infected countries. So that tells us that potentially with a 1% case fatality rate, if it was to spread through 80% of the world's population, we could be still looking at a very significant number of deaths, 62 million, which is uh, more than HIV or Spanish flu. There's no treatment uh, or vaccine yet. And the collateral economic and health damage is overwhelming. So uh, huge uncertainty, blizzard storm or little ice age, this article by Andy Crouch, uh, I thought was very poignant. Are we looking at a few, at a storm which will last a few weeks, at a, a winter which will last a few months, or is this more like a little ice age that's going to be with us for some years? And I think it's pretty clear now we're in that latter category. The economic effects, well rehearsed. Uh, the, the Dow Jones, of course, largely recovered, but uh, in the last couple of days, it's taken a big hit with uh, the hit on big tech, the FANG companies. Uh, most countries in the world now are on the brink of recession or in it, the red ones uh, in particular. And uh, unemployment, these are largely Western countries here, but you can see the massive increase in unemployment figures in all of those countries. And global debt levels are now at the highest level they've been since World War II. So you can see the blue line here for developed economies is up at World War II level. And emerging economies, it's the highest it's ever been. And so it's going to take many years to recover from the economic damage. And of course, the important message there is that the, the prime indicator of health in a country is how much that country spends on healthcare. That's very, very clear from all the stats. The, the flight to precious metals, the gold and silver prices here you see are just another evidence of the economic uncertainty. Medical effects, this was the Lancet view, the pandemic's dismantling the foundations for protecting and advancing health. Global health has entered 
a period of rapid reversal and de-development as the new norm. And we're only looking here at, at headlines, but we know in developing countries, especially lockdown has led to hunger and famine, uh, 70 million being pushed into extreme poverty, worsening mental health, family breakdown, domestic abuse, and then uh, making backwards progress on the big diseases, HIV, TB, malaria, but also chronic diseases. So we've got the first surge here, the first wave of COVID and the, the deaths it causes. The second wave is uh, what, what's happening now, we're seeing in some European countries. The third wave is the impact on interrupted care on chronic conditions. And this fourth wave is the psychological trauma or mental illness or the economic injury that impacts on health. So 70 million into extreme poverty, 265 million likely to face starvation by the end of the year as a result of, of COVID. Uh, number of children dying from missed vaccinations is likely to impact the numbers of people dying from COVID-19. Uh, uh, impact on HIV, TB and malaria, 1.4 million extra deaths uh, from TB predicted this year, which is equal to the normal number of deaths and increases uh, of estimated percentages here. Uh, then the impact on non-communicable diseases, uh, largely because of people not being able to get care because of poor transport or lockdown uh, affecting travel or health resources being diverted into caring for COVID patients. So all types of non-communicable diseases, including, of course, cancer as well. And then particularly in developing countries, uh, impact on childbirth because mothers are presenting later for delivery. There's a greater risk of pregnancy-related conditions, vitamin A distribution, and so on. So that's uh, the background medically. And each of the uh, 17 sustainable development goals that the WHO recognise has a healthcare element. And so there is going to be a big effect. So in terms of where we go to from here, we first need to ask, well, where, where were we before COVID uh, with respect to the Great Commission, healthcare and healthcare mission? So I'm just looking at very much the big picture here, but we have Jesus has promised that the gospel will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So that's one of the markers of his approaching return. And when we look at the world uh, in this terms of the spread of the gospel, especially the last 200 years, it's been really quite phenomenal. So 33% of the world's population, they may not all be Bible-believing Christians, but they would call themselves uh, Christians. That is really quite uh, remarkable indeed. If we look at the Christian population in different countries, you can see the USA is marginally the biggest, but it's going to be passed by China by the year 2030. And uh, we've got countries like Brazil, Nigeria, Mexico, and so on, very large populations of Christians. It's uh, the darker blue, the higher the percentage of people who identify as Christian of course, particularly strong in, in Central and South America and in Sub-Saharan Africa. And the pale area, of course, is the 1040 window between 10 and 40 degrees north of the equator, where most of the unreached people groups of the world exist. And uh, those are also, with the exception perhaps of India and one or two other countries, they are not, uh, they don't tend to be the countries where there's a lot of healthcare mission going on. And so there's a huge door opening because healthcare can open the door to the gospel where people cannot go with a Bible or a seminary degree. But just looking at Africa from 8 million to 630 million Christians in Africa just over the last century. And this is China. The red line is the Communist Party, the blue line. Christians in China are uh, uh, now are passing the communist membership, which is why there's so much anxiety amongst Chinese communists. But God is very much on the, on the move, and particularly in the global south, the, the gospel is spreading and people are coming into God's kingdom. Now, we have a tendency when we think about medical uh, things to think that everything's getting worse. I think that's a great temptation as Christians to think that things in the world are getting 
worse. But actually, if we look at what's happening, I'd particularly recommend Hans Rosling's book, Factfulness. And I've just tabulated here some of the graphs that we haven't got time to go through in detail. You are welcome to have all these slides, incidentally, afterwards. But I've just listed here the things, the health indices and influences that are actually getting better over the last 100 years. And it really is quite phenomenal. Clean water and immunization, child cancer survival, uh, hunger, maternal and child mortality, scientific uh, publications and so on. We've made incredible progress medically, uh, not just in the West, but worldwide over the last 100 years. Most things are moving in the right direction, even despite the disruptions of COVID. This is the share of the world living in extreme poverty from 40% down to 5% over the last 50 years. That's quite incredible. And of course, the, the pattern of disease has changed as well, so that the top 10 global causes of deaths now are non-communicable diseases, ischemic heart disease, stroke, chronic obstructive respiratory disease, cancers, and so on. That's worldwide we're talking about, not just in the West. So there's a big change, which of course impacts the way we do mission. So non-communicable diseases are now causing 70% of all deaths globally. And it's very interesting that these four big categories here, they're all lifestyle related, inactivity, eating, alcohol, tobacco use, and so on, which underlies the importance of public health. When we look at disability, here are the, uh, the 10 biggest causes. I think what's striking in this list is how many of them are mental health related. Major depression, number one. Uh, bipolar disorder, number six. Schizophrenia, obsessive compulsive disorder. And so it's not just what's killing people, but what is causing uh, difficulty for them in terms of disability. Uh, people often say there's no need for hospitals anymore, but uh, I think this Lancet study was overwhelmingly uh, poignant. Uh, Five million people in the world without access to safe and affordable surgical care and anesthesia. 143 million additional surgical procedures needed in low and middle income countries each year. And you no, know, I'm a general surgeon. I come from a family where my uh, my father and more recently my wife were both saved by cardiac surgery. Uh, my mother saved from breast cancer. Probably all three of them will get 25 to 30 more years as a result of it. It's not just uh, debt life-saving, but also disabilities as well. Primary health care is being talked about. Half of the world's population lack access to essential health services because GPs and family practitioners are not being trained in many parts of the world and people are being pushed into poverty because they have to pay for care out of their own pockets. 80 to 90 percent of health care needs can be covered by primary health care. I said earlier on it's about how much you spend on health. This uh, shows uh, health spending of course which is highest in North America, in Scandinavia and Europe in Oceania, where I come from, Japan, and so on. Healthcare is uh, spending is lowest in sub-Saharan Africa and in the 1040 window. And if we look at the healthiest countries of the world in terms of health indices, it mirrors that graph exactly. It's what you spend on healthcare that is the biggest determinant of what happens with health. And uh, we know maternal mortality is greatly increased, but there's still a huge problem in in sub-Saharan Africa. That's where the, the main issue is now. If we look at child mortality again, it's sub-Saharan Africa where there is the greatest need. And so uh, now the most important question, what are the implications for healthcare mission uh, in the light of all of these things that we've looked at? What's happening with COVID? What's happened to the world? Where we're at with healthcare and mission generally? Well, uh, what's going to be more difficult what healthcare mission approaches need reviewing, what new opportunities are there, and what should be our key priorities. Now, I'm going to go through this very quickly, and it's really just headlines, but I hope it will um, stimulate us to be thinking about these things. Uh, we had a meeting earlier this year with the USAID talking about a project, uh, and uh, these were some of the quotes I thought were so striking from USAID staff, uh, many of whom were Christian, 
about the Ebola crisis. We thought in disease silos rather than in terms of comprehensive health care. We did it all ourselves rather than training others. We failed to build any lasting infrastructure. We didn't invest in training and we left them vulnerable to the same thing happening all over again. And I know USAID has really changed its strategy in the light of Ebola and is thinking much more comprehensively now about what they do and we should be doing the same in healthcare mission. Now we all know the things that are going to be uh, more difficult. They came back in the Q&A, crossing borders, obtaining visas, air travel, less frequent, probably more expensive. I did 20 trips to 19 countries last year, but uh, this last year I've spent most of the time since February sitting at the dining room table where I am now. Uh, it's going to be much more difficult to get into lower and middle income countries without a professional qualification. So much harder for pastors and evangelists, particularly in limited access countries. Uh, we won't see as many large residential conferences and meetings. Think uh, what happened to CMDE this year. Making short-term visits is going to be much more difficult with quarantine. Raising funds is going to be more difficult because of the effects of the recession in the West. And it's going to be much harder to support full-time expatriate missionaries going into the, to the future in lower and middle income countries. Now, uh, of course, there are lots of different approaches to mission. Uh, these are past and present approaches that are I'm not saying there's no place for these, obviously there is, that's my key point. But it, my point is that these approaches that we have used are not going to meet the needs on their own. We need to be thinking outside the box much more. Western is doing short-term mission trips to provide direct care, doing things for and to people rather than with them or training them. International mission societies, doing healthcare work. They do great work, but when we look at the number of mission hospitals uh, and church hospitals that there are alone, over 1,500 in Africa and Asia, how many of them have any connection with international mission societies? Not many at all now. Relying on expatriate personnel, over-trained health professionals running frontline community health and mobile clinics, we, we can't uh, do it anymore. It's got to be the, the person with the minimal training that's enough full-time Western workers supported by home churches uh, and so on. And the new uh, patterns, they say COVID is speeding everything up. These are some of the things that COVID is speeding up. We're moving from a colonial West to the rest model to a from everywhere to everywhere model. That's true with healthcare as well, from curative to preventive, from paternalism to partnership, from full-time church planters, pastors and evangelists to tent makers, from university trained professionals to lay workers, from pioneering in new areas to working within secular systems, particularly in places of limited access. So uh, just uh, to, to finish, 10 strategic priorities for healthcare mission, I'll just throw out. Uh, the first two are much longer than the rest, which we'll go through very quickly. But uh, first of all, uh, teaching and training indigenous health professionals. Give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, teach him how to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. And there are lots of opportunities, uh, different ways of doing training of uh, both doctors and other healthcare professionals abroad. You can get into North Korea as a preclinical or clinical teacher and teach the sons and daughters of the leaders of the Communist Party at, at Pyongyang University of Science and Technology. It's an open door for Westerners at the moment. PAX has been mentioned very time, uh, very many times during this conference. They will have trained 100 African surgeons to US board certified level by the end of this year in a dozen different hospitals. Wonderful model. Distance uh, education and blended learning. We're seeing a lot more of this virtual classrooms, online lectures. It's going to be possible for someone to produce a medical curriculum for a whole country, which can be used just about anywhere. Uh, medical schools are going to be very different in the future in an increasingly IT connected world. Uh, educational technology is growing, uh, video lectures, examinations, objectively online, skills laboratories, uh, and so on. 
the de democratization of ed education providing access for all so wherever you are you will be able to do it at much less cost that's going to be huge for the global south uh, icmda uh, we launched together with loma linda university and christian medical college in Valor. Uh, a family medicine diploma, distance learning, right in the middle of the COVID pandemic. We've got 32 students from 15 countries doing this uh, 15 modules over two years. Uh, they cost not very much to train uh, at all. The, uh, of course, uh, public health has been mentioned, lay workers, uh, CMC Valor has a training program for community health workers where they take pastors and evangelists and train them in healthcare. This is another US mission, Teach to Transform, which is training doctors and medical students in sub-Saharan Africa to uh, teach and train uh, at community health level. PRIME is a, a US, um, a, uh, sorry, a UK initiative whereby family practitioners go on teaching trips abroad to train medical health professionals. Uh, we, we had to switch this year from conferences to webinars. We've run 22 so far, mainly on COVID, but we get uh, an average of 200 doctors from 40 to 50 countries listening in on those. We record them all and many more can watch afterwards. So that's number one, teaching and training. Number two, bivocational tent makers working for secular NGOs, businesses and government institutions. Following, of course, Paul's model, he supported himself along with Priscilla and Aquila. It gives entry into closed countries, provides natural opportunities to build relationships with people. It can conserve scarce mission funds for missionaries that must have full support. And uh, lots of different places that tent makers can get into with NGOs, teaching hospitals, church and mission hospitals, and so on. If you want to go to somewhere like our Metna region, where we have very few member groups or even contact groups, it's as a tent maker that you've got to go. And there are many Christian initiatives now, Scatter Global is a good example of it, placing professionals, especially doctors and nurses, into limited access countries as tent makers. Huge hospitals in Saudi Arabia with thousands of beds where Christian doctors can just walk in and uh, work and teach as tent makers, Tent International, Another example, Western recruitment, lots of secular agencies. There are huge openings. When God closes one door, he opens others. And there are doors opening wide through tent making. Uh, in, in the ICMDA, we have three paid staff and 45 field workers. They're all tent makers. They all work part-time or full-time in medicine or dentistry and do their work with students and national leaders in their spare time. We pay only travel expenses which brings us to starting and strengthening national movements of christian doctors and dentists which is very much the work of icmda that's our our vision christian witness everywhere every community every nation but we believe the best way of doing that is starting and strengthening national movements so building cmdas all over the world we started with 12 in 1966 there are now 84 we plan to have 100 by uh, 2022 at our next World Congress, whether that's real, virtual or, or hybrid, that's the aim. And the green countries have uh, national movements which are formally affiliated with ICMDA, the orange ones, national groups which are moving towards affiliation, and the blue ones where we have individual contacts. So the growth has been exponential and are wonderfully important to strengthen and start these groups. And I think that American Christian doctors have a huge role to play uh, in this, particularly in the countries that God has placed them already. Which brings us to building partnerships with national Christian healthcare associations, uh, that we call them the, the CHAPs or the CHAZs, the, the CHABs and so on. But uh, most of the countries in Asia and in Sub-Saharan Africa have a Christian healthcare association with hospitals, clinics, and individuals. You can see some of the some of the ones that are better now mentioned there, but there are over about 30 of these altogether around the world. Are we building links with them? Very, very important. Training and evangelism and discipleship, because it's going to be tent makers in the future, or barefoot doctors, or uh, community health workers 
who are doing it. So they need to be trained in how to share the gospel effectively. Uh, Saline is one initiative which started with CMDA in the US and has now gone global and operating in about 50 countries around the world, helping doctors and nurses how to share their faith with sensitivity, permission and respect. <clears throat> IT, telemedicine, uh, these are just the 10 biggest technological advances for healthcare in the last 15 years. And we won't go through them, you can look at the list, but they have absolutely revolutionized the way that medicine is going to be practiced in the future. And uh, just one example, the, the, the loon which uh, came off, uh, I think it was, oh, I, I won't say, I think it was Alpha, uh, Google that, that launched initially, but I may be wrong there. But uh, these are uh, big uh, satellites, balloon satellites, the size of a tennis court. They're geostationary. They launch them up to twice the height that a jet will fly, and they can give you a 50 mile diameter coverage with IT connections. So the whole world is going to be connected without uh, cables and towers uh, through, through this kind of innovative technology. It's going to happen very, very quickly. And that's going to make things like telemedicine and distance education much, much easier. And it's a huge priority to get our hospitals and healthcare centers properly um, connected uh, for all of these things. Uh, Ludhiana is one of the world leaders in India in their telemedicine program. We can go to the website and see one of the best specialists in the country and uh, book an online appointment and have all your letters and uh, results posted up there. Leadership training I've mentioned already and it's been highlighted by others. In ICMDA we make a big priority of this. It's not just about ethics, it's about training boards, it's about governance, it's about uh, sharing faith, uh, all sorts of things, but uh, developing and training leaders. Capacity building, uh, infrastructure, governance and equipment. I think one of the world leaders here is uh, African Mission Healthcare. I know Perry Jansen is here this week speaking on this, doing some wonderful work with a vision of developing 50 uh, top mission hospitals into teaching and training centers for postgraduate training and really being salt and light in their communities. Uh, and I think this is perhaps one of the, the areas where where missions which have healthcare really need to be thinking about our hospitals. How can we make them centers of excellence for postgraduate training? And then this new investment strategies. Uh, we have to, uh, we, of course, there is a place for full-time Western missionaries, but we've got to think much more broadly than that and think about the best way we can spend our, our money that we can raise and increase the amount that we raise, investing into training schemes, scholarships, bursaries, uh, covering expenses for tent makers and trainers rather than salaries, investing into IT, hospital infrastructure, uh, and so on, and supporting ICMDA uh, national groups. Many of them have little money, no staff, no resources, but a huge amount of passion and a great degree of vision. And I'd love to see more links between expatriate Western doctors and these national groups building around the world. I think there's great opportunity for partnership. And then uh, this is my final point, uh, an overflow of Western generosity in finance, training, equipment and personnel. And we, we all know that we've been hit by COVID, but we are still the world's rich. We're in the top one to 2%. We have overwhelming wealth and resources compared with most of the world. And of course, from those to whom much has been given, much will be expected. And uh, of course we have uh, Ezekiel talking about Jerusalem. This was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. Let that not be said of us in this generation. May we be uh, the opposite. May it not be said of us that we have material possessions, see our brother or sister in need, but have no pity. But may it be said of us rather, as it was said of our Lord Jesus Christ, who emptied himself of everything and gave everything to pour himself out, that we might be saved and that we might be transformed. That though he was rich for our sake, he became poor, so that through his poverty, we might become rich. And I think 
uh, that is one of the biggest challenges for us in the West. If we can't travel, if we can't do what we've done before in the same way, uh, how can we help in other ways with the huge blessings that God has given us, and particularly the US, which has been the world leader in mission over the last 50 years. What's, what are the priorities for you going forward? Because I'm sure that you have a huge uh, role to play. So there we are. You'll be thankful that this is my last slide uh, summary. The pandemic's going to be with us for a long time. It will severely disrupt healthcare. We were making great progress, but the old patterns will no longer suffice. We need to embrace new opportunities and we need most of all to embrace an unprecedented new level of generosity, both uh, with our uh, financial resources, but also our medical resources and our professional training, which is perhaps our greatest gift to the world in terms of equipping and training others in the global south. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Peter. That was very full and comprehensive uh, comments from you all. We have about seven minutes. I, I would like to ask Peter, um, you know, Peter was my guest on my podcast and we had a great conversation. Thank you, Peter. This, I just wrote in chat. I, I definitely want your PowerPoint. There's some really classic slides that we can all use um, as we're sharing with people. Um, I'm just wondering, it seems like you showed the graph that in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's really not, COVID is not having the uptake. It doesn't seem like we're seeing um, the patients. Now, Sherry Falkenheimer rightly said, well, maybe it's because we're not testing enough, but the connections I have to mission hospitals and clinics in Africa, they're not being overwhelmed with patients uh, and overwhelming numbers of patients for many of them. Is there, is there a hypothesis on why that's the case? Well, we talk about this every week, and I, I wish I could give you a real evidence-based answer to it, but I can only give you what, what people are saying. I think the first thing is that it's early days for Africa. And remember, we were saying this about India three months ago. Why isn't it spread to India? Why, isn't it, why is it only in the big cities? Why isn't it in the towns and rural areas? We now know it's absolutely everywhere in India and everywhere they're being overwhelmed. Although uh, there are mitigating factors, a, a smaller percentage of old people uh, partic in particular, and many of the migrant communities in slums in the big cities who we thought would be overrun have not been. And we think that's largely because the older generation who are more vulnerable are still at home. So it's the migrant workers who are, are more resilient to, to this. But it certainly is now impacting India everywhere. And when you look at those figures, you see a thousand deaths a day. But the really telling figure is that whereas countries like uh, the UK and the US are up to five or six hundred deaths per million people, India is only at 50. And so there's a very, very long way to go. And it's really out of control in India. They made a lot of mistakes, particularly uh, imposing lockdown before the disease was there, uh, allowing all the migrant workers who make up 30% of the population to be infected, and then sending them all home. It couldn't have been designed better for a disaster. I think with Africa, uh, it, we're seeing it mainly around the big hubs, uh, big air uh, contact hubs in, in Cairo, Nairobi, particularly Johannesburg, South Africa has taken the biggest hit. I think lockdown's been very effective in stopping the spread, but um, uh, how how quickly and how far it will come, we don't know. But I think it's going to be many, many months and probably running into years in Africa. And we still think it's important to equip people, although it's very difficult to, uh, because they're so distracted with the great need of other medical kinds that they have already. Any other, <clears throat> thanks, Peter. Any other comments or reactions to that? You just think about the, <clears throat> the number of the, uh, these resource, you know, the resource limited. So w what about just resources being overwhelmed? I mean, as they have in some places, as they've nearly been overwhelmed in other, 
places, Peter. Um, what do you do when, oh, with all your preparation, it becomes, uh, it, it may become in some places Im impossible to sort of handle it in, in, in traditional models. Will that, will that break out, uh, enable us to force us to break out into some new creative ways of thinking? I think, I think there's a huge amount that we can do. Uh, we've been working with uh, CMC Valor. They uh, started a course in India uh, funded by the Tata Trust, so it was a private charity corporation, to train people in COVID preparedness for hospitals. Uh, the aim of training 5,000 healthcare workers who would then train others in their hospitals. So everything from isolation, quarantine, to oxygen therapy, to even ventilators if they had them. So we're, we're starting to roll that out around the world in Africa and Asia now. It's very much early days. But uh, I think that that is important. I think the creativity has been overwhelmed. If you've got a spare half hour, then uh, go to the ICMDA website and look at yesterday's webinar from Professor George Matthew, who was a past uh, principal at, um, or the director at CMC Valor Hospital, a huge hospital in the south of India. And he's telling about his experience from a small mission hospital in the northeast of India, where they're being overwhelmed now with a thousand cases every day in the state that they're in and uh, what they have done with no resources is phenomenal not one uh, staff member has had COVID and they've not had one person die of COVID and uh, the way they've produced uh, PPE protocols um, managed it with military precision has been absolutely amazing and of course all and uh, underlined by prayer uh, with God providing miracles in terms of provision of food uh, for staff and patients who had nothing to, to eat. So there's some wonderful stories of what God is doing out there. Uh, when people give their very meager resources, he works miracles. And, and I think it's, it's good to tell about these stories and, and spread them. I think there's wonderful things uh, happening. Okay, one question comes in, uh, Peter, how can we coordinate our training efforts and requests from lower and middle income companies to maximize our ability to meet? How do we coordinate our training efforts? I, th I think I, I'd come back to, to what was said in the last presentation, the importance of building relationships, uh, relational, uh, you know, making relationships a real priority. And I think it all boils down to relationships. I think it's about mission leaders getting to know uh, uh, peop uh, politicians, but particularly people in the CHAs, the Christian Healthcare Associations, the leaders of the national movements of Christian doctors and dentists, uh, other missions who are working in the area. And uh, when people come together and they confront the need, they can come up with solutions that they could never have dreamt up by themselves. So I think this is, a, as, as Mike Soderling was telling us yesterday, this is a very complex, complicated problem. It needs lots of different heads and lots of different people. So it's a, a real opportunity for the body of Christ to shine, I think, with every person bringing their gifts, their perspective, their personalities, their experience, their resources in terms of training and finance together, and then asking what we can do.